हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वांटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Pakistan's election was rigged and that's not news anymore but now an election official has said it it's an explosive statement with names and details of how the general stole Imran Khan's votes will the US still call it a competitive election the people of Pakistan are protesting and there's been another another round of internet shutdowns we'll bring you the full story in the Israel Hamas war Netanyahu is pushing for the Rafah offensive as his allies and adversaries slam his moves Wars are bad news unless you're an oil company because then you're rolling in money. We bring you the big profits of big oil and what does it mean for you and me? Meanwhile, no slowdown in layoffs, 25,000 and counting in the first two months of this year. Highlights from the Munich Security Conference, Donald Trump selling his all-new golden sneakers, the many controversies dogging Nigeria's president, how Wall Street is pushing up the price of your chocolate and an introduction to Gen Alpha that can ace the iPad but perhaps not tie shoelaces all this and more coming up the headlines first Beijing tells Washington to stop harassing Chinese students this comes after reports of interrogation and deportation of Chinese students at a key US airport on Sunday Beijing raised the issue with Washington during talks held in Vienna a few weeks ago China had launched a formal protest against the US for allegedly blocking Chinese students at the border Germany summons the Russian ambassador over Alexei Navalny's death on Friday Navalny one of Putin's fiercest critics died in his arctic prison the kremlin says an investigation into his death has begun but russian authorities are yet to hand over navalny's body to his relatives european union launches a formal probe into the tiktok into tiktok over child protection the social media app is accused of breaching rules that protect minors online if found guilty chinese owned tiktok faces fines of up to 6% of its global turnover in india the opposition congress party trying hard to keep its flock together congress has seen a leader kamal nath is not jumping ship ahead of the election But speculation is rife that the former chief minister of Madhya Pradesh might join the ruling BJP. Recently, many senior leaders have quit the Congress party. And Cambodia looks to invite looks to India to revive its big cat population, hopes to import four tigers from India this year. The last sighting of a tiger in Cambodia was in 2007. In 2016, they were declared functionally extinct in the country. If you're a dictator, how would you rig an election? You could jail your opponents, you could ban them from contesting the election, you could even erase their political identity by denying them their election symbol. The nuclear option is to rig the vote. That's what most dictators resort to, and Pakistan's military is no different. They did everything on this dictator's checklist, but they couldn't hide the rigging because now an insider has blown the whistle. कि मैं वो इलेक्शन ठीक नहीं करवा सका और मैं अपने उदय से यहां इस्तीफा दे रहा हूं मैंने जो इस इलेक्शन में गलत काम किया है राहुल पिंडी के तेरह एम एल ए की सीटें जो हारे हुए लोगों को हमने जितवाया है लोगों की सत्तर सत्तर हजार की लीड को हमने उनकी शिकस्त में बदला है That man is Liaquat Ali Chatta. He was the election commissioner for Rawalpindi. He rigged the votes there. He turned losers into winners. Some candidates had a lead of as much as seventy thousand. This official reversed all those votes, and victory was stolen from at least thirty-one, thirteen candidates. Who were these candidates? They were the independents from Imran Khan's party. The military stole their seats. after months of trying to weaken the party you know that story from jailing imran khan to banning him from the airwaves to taking away his party symbol the bat they did everything but imran khan's independence defeated the odds that's when the generals went ahead and stole the votes chatta's confession is revealing but not surprising at all he said he was forced to change the votes by whom he has given two names the first one is the chief election commissioner His name is Sikandar Sultan Raja. He's a civil servant, the same official who came out after polling and announced the delay in counting and results. 
But the second character in this drama is more significant. He's the Chief Justice of Pakistan's Supreme Court, Qazi Faiz Issa. Justice Issa is an old foe of Imran Khan. As Prime Minister Imran Khan went after this judge, his government accused Justice Issa of concealing assets. They tried to get this judge dismissed, but they did not succeed. And a few months later, Justice Issa was elevated to the top job. He became the Chief Justice of Pakistan. He was the judge who took away the bat symbol from Imran Khan's party, PTI. Imran Khan tried his best to mend ties. In November last year, he wrote a letter to Justice Issa urging him to protect his party's fundamental rights. The Chief Justice responded with a letter of his own. This is what he wrote. CJP, Chief Justice of Pakistan, Issa, will neither be pressurized nor favor anyone. That's what he wrote. But now he's being implicated in the election rigging. Of course, he denies all these allegations, but Imran Khan supporters are not convinced. They have been protesting and demanding the release of their leader. <laughs> Over the weekend, four Pakistani cities saw major protests, Islamabad, Karachi, Peshawar and Lahore. There was another internet shutdown. Twitter or X was down in Pakistan. Authorities say the shutdown was in response to quote-unquote recent incidents of terrorism in Pakistan. But it's not really rocket science to figure out why they did it. News about Chatta's confession was spreading and Pakistan's deep state wanted the story to die down. Well, we have news for them. It's not dying. It is snowballing. Reports say Chatta has now been arrested. Meanwhile, Imran Khan and his aides are ramping up their campaign. The former prime minister has released yet another video. It features a journalist showing fake ballot papers. I am in Lakshmi Chowk, a printing press, where my thoughts have been told that the election of the 8th February, in which Nawaz Sharif and Mansera Wale seat have been lost, the ballot papers are being shot. These claims are serious and compelling. They're also raising tensions. Pakistan's mandate was tampered with. The execution was shoddy and the results disastrous. But the military is being allowed to get away with all of it, not only by Pakistan's supposedly free institutions, but also by the likes of the United States. They've given Rawal Pindi a clean chit. We told you about this last week. The U.S. State Department called the election clearly competitive. That's the term they used. No mention of the rigging, despite the smoking guns. And now there is a confession to back up the claims. It remains to be seen how the military will clean up this mess and how its Western allies will justify it. Let's turn to West Asia now, where Israel's war on Gaza continues. It's now day 136 of the fighting. Most of Gaza has been flattened by bombings. Just one safe haven remains, or a relatively safe place. The southernmost border town of Rafah. But maybe not for long. Israel is preparing for a ground operation in Rafah, and that could be deadly. Around 1.7 million Gazans have been displaced by the fighting. Most of them now live in Rafah. It was supposed to be a no-fighting zone. Western countries tried to keep it that way. Earlier this month, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Israel. He tried to prevent the Rafah offensive. The last week, ceasefire talks resumed. Israel and Hamas were negotiating indirectly. Qatar and Egypt were the mediators. They were talking about a ceasefire. Their goal was to stop the attack on Rafah, but no luck. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has decided to go ahead. He says, even if hostages are released, Rafa will be attacked. Even if they do it, I can't tell you, according to Hamas' delusional positions, it doesn't seem that close. But even if we make it, we will enter Rafa. There is no substitute for absolute victory and there is no way to achieve absolute victory without eliminating these battalions in Rafa and we will do it. Do we have a timeline? There hasn't been an official announcement, but most Israeli leaders have hinted at Ramadan. The holy month of Islam, it begins on the 10th of March, so chances are Israel will attack next month. What happens then? First, Gazans were asked to leave the north, so they fled to Rafah. Now Israel is saying, leave Rafah as well. So where will these people go? Further south in Egypt's, is Egypt's Sinai Desert. But will Cairo welcome them? That is the question. Well, there is some activity on the Egyptian side. Concrete walls are being erected. Apparently, the plan is to build a refugee shelter, a place where Gazans can stay temporarily. Of course, Egypt has not admitted to any of this plan 
any such plan. Their official position is, we won't take any Ghazis. It is not our intention to uh, provide any uh, safe areas or, or uh, facilities, uh, but uh, necessarily, if, if this was uh, a case and uh, a situation, we will deal with the humanity that is necessary and we will provide the support to the innocent civilians uh, if that was to take place. But uh, that should not be construed as an encouragement or a, a, an acceptance for uh, an eventuality of this nature. An attack on Rafah would be a major escalation. A, the casualties would be massive, and B, it would endanger Israel's peace deal with Egypt. Both sides normalized relations in 1979, Egypt and Israel. It was the first Israel-Arab peace deal. If it unravels, it would be a major setback. So Netanyahu needs to be careful here. Even his allies are losing patience with him. Joe Biden says Israel's war has gone over the top. EU, European, Euro, European Union members say an attack on Rafah would be unconscionable. Yet, Netanyahu is going ahead. And why is that? Because the war is keeping him in office. Polls show that most Israelis want him out. If elections were to be held today, chances are his party would lose. He was asked about elections over the weekend, and this was his response. I suggest we don't concern ourselves with, with that during the war. The last thing we need right now is elections. That's what Netanyahu said. But his party leaders are thinking about it. They say Netanyahu will be out after the war. Is that why he's extending the fighting? To cling on to power? Well, it's certainly possible because more fighting doesn't help Israel. It re reduces the chance of rescuing hostages. It radicalizes Gaza's population further. And it also turns the international community away from Israel. In fact, it's already happening. Countries in the global south are taking on Netanyahu. We've seen South Africa do that. They sued Israel. Now, Brazil is comparing Israel's war to the Holocaust. What is happening in the Gaza Strip with the Palestinian people has no parallel in other historical moments. In fact, it did exist when Hitler decided to kill the Jews. Many would say that's crossing a line. The Holocaust has very few parallels in history. The scale and suffering is incomparable. Having said that, you get the drift. Some 29,000 people have been killed in Gaza. Over 12,000 of them are children, plus 85% of the population has been displaced, so Gazans are suffering. Yet the comparison to Holocaust does make you flinch. Netanyahu called it disgraceful. Today, the president of Brazil by comparing Israel's war in Gaza against Hamas, a genocidal terrorist organization, to the Holocaust, President Silva has disgraced the memory of six million Jews murdered by the Nazis, and he's demonized the Jewish state like the most virulent anti-Semite. He should be ashamed of himself. The next few weeks will be crucial. A lot depends on Western support, especially support from the United States. We've seen some half-hearted criticism from the White House, but in practice, nothing has changed. The United Nations Security Council will soon vote on another ceasefire. Washington has hinted at vetoing it. Same with military aid. Biden is seeking almost $95 billion in funding. $14 billion of that is for Israel. What does that tell you? Biden's words and actions do not match. And neither do Netanyahu's. He promised to protect the civilians of Gaza. He said they would be safe in the south. Well, safe to say, neither promise has been kept. One group doesn't mind the war, though. In Ukraine, in Gaza, it really doesn't matter for them. And that group is big oil. You see, war equals instability. Instability equals higher prices. And higher oil price equals bumper profits. How much money are we talking about? $281 billion. That's how much the five largest listed oil companies have made since February 2022. $281 billion. Since February 2022, meaning since the Ukraine war. So 24 months, $281 billion in profits. Which are these oil companies? BP, Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Total Energies. All of them are European or American. BP and Shell made $94 billion in profits. The other three made $187 billion. But why is this news? After all, companies are designed to make money. 
It also means more returns for investors. So what's the problem here? Well, there are two problems. Number one, these profits coincided with a tough time for households. Our inflation is going through the roof. In some countries, it was in double digits. Yet big oil was making big money and their profits fueled our inflation. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the setback to climate goals. The oil industry, you see, makes up 15% of total emissions. It's one of the biggest causes of climate change. But the same oil industry is making big bucks. It is giving massive returns to investors. In 2022, big oil rewarded shareholders with $104 billion. In 2023, with around $100 billion. Now, do you see the problem here? Why will oil companies turn green if oil is making so much money? When it's making investors so happy? They have no reason to change. So most big oil companies are going back to default. Take Shell, for example. Last year, they cut 330 jobs in the low-carbon businesses. A new CEO took charge in 2023. He says expanding oil and gas production is the priority. What about green energy? For now, it will have to take a back seat. Same with BP. They had promised to reduce emissions by the end of this decade by around 35 to 40 percent. That was the promise. But now BP says that's not possible. So their new target is 20 to 30 percent. So big oil is going back on its promise. And why is that? What has changed in the last two years? For starters, oil prices have shot up in the last few years. Just look at the numbers. The pandemic years were tough for big oil. Most factories were shut. Cars were locked away in the garage. So oil demand was very low. The prices fell to $32 in 2020. I'm saying I'm talking about $32 per barrel. That's what it was in 2020. By December 2021, things looked up. Oil prices had recovered to $67 per barrel. Then came Russia's war on Ukraine. By mid-2022, the prices had topped $112 per barrel. Big oil firms were minting money again. Another jolt came in late 2023. Hamas launched an attack on Israel. So West Asia was plunged into war. Oil prices rose once again. Today, it's around $82 per barrel. So it makes sense to invest in fossil fuels again. There's a lot of money to be made. Secondly, big oil has found a solution to keep investors quiet. Shower them with money. Shell gave rewards worth $23 billion in 2023. Their profits had fallen compared to 2022, yet Shell decided to splurge on investors. In fact, $23 billion is six times what they invested in green energy. BP did something similar. They had promised to raise dividends by 4% every year, but the actual raise last year in 2023 was 10%. So investors are more than happy to give their blessings. Activists have tried to put pressure on them. Some have disrupted investors' meetings, but nothing seems to work. So what's the solution? We say government policy. There's been talk of imposing windfall taxes on big oil, or maybe a green cess. But we need more than talks. We need actions. Like I said at the start, companies are designed to make money. Investors are hardwired to want money. There is no point trying to change that. Instead, governments must incentivize big oil to invest in green energy. How? Through carrots like subsidies and sticks like taxes. If not, big oil won't change its ways. 2023 was the year of layoffs. Thousands lost their jobs. Around 250,000 people globally. Many believed that was it, that the job cuts were done. But 2024 is proving to be no different. This year began with another series of layoffs. They weren't as bad as last year, but companies are still cutting jobs. Cisco is laying off 4,250 people, around 5% of its global workforce. The company says it is part of a restructuring plan. It was to realign its structure and invest in other key priority areas. Now, it's not like Cisco was running at a loss. The company posted solid second quarter earnings, around $12.8 billion in revenue. So why does it feel the need to restructure? Cisco has given two reasons. Weak demand and a tough economy. And they aren't the only ones. Nike cut around 1,700 jobs. That's, again, about 2% of their workforce. The sports giant wants to cut cost. Around $2 billion in the next three years. That's their aim. The company will now focus on three major categories, running, women's apparel, and its Jordan brand. Most resources will be directed towards that. Paramount is also laying off people, some 800 of them. 
around 2% of their workforce. This is to boost its transition from TV to streaming. Snapchat has cut around 500 jobs. That's 10% of its workforce. The company says it is to reduce hierarchy. Grammarly has laid off 230 people. The company says it wants to focus on an AI-led future. Instacart is laying off around 250 employees. Mozilla is cutting 5% of its jobs. PayPal has started company-wide layoffs. SpiceJet will lay off some 1,400 people. Swiggy is cutting 400 jobs. Vroom is laying off 90% of its workforce. Pixar is cutting more jobs. So you get the gist. It's everywhere. We're in the second month of this year and 25,000 jobs have already been cut. More companies are expected to follow suit, which brings us to the question, why are layoffs not slowing down? Mark Zuckerberg has a theory. The Meta CEO was asked about this, and he says companies realize it's beneficial to be lean. Of course, Zuckerberg is talking about the tech sector, but it's an answer that holds true for all. You see, when the pandemic struck, many companies grew too fast, especially tech companies. But soon the world opened up. People returned to normalcy, the economy adjusted, and demand went back to normal. But companies were still too big. So this right now is correction. Organizations grew too big too fast. Now they're cutting jobs to save costs. It's being touted as, as trying to achieve efficiency. At least that's what Zuckerberg says. So will this trend continue throughout the year? And that's the outlook for now. The global economy is slowing down. Growth is sluggish. Some major economies are in recession. Others are bracing for it. Inflation is driving up prices. Customers are watching their wallets and so are companies. But chasing profits is only one side of the story. The other side is artificial intelligence. Jobs are being automated. So humans are becoming redundant. I know that sounds alarming, but it's not all bad. A lot of people may lose their jobs to AI, but it's also creating new roles, especially in the tech space. Take NVIDIA, Microsoft, Meta. They're all looking to hire people, but only in more AI-focused roles. So while the last year was about mass layoffs, this one seems to be about cost cutting. You could say it means the same thing, more pink slips, and you won't be wrong. Some news from Germany now. Every year it hosts a very important diplomatic event, the Munich Security Conference. It began way back in 1963 during the height of the Cold War. Today it has expanded to become a massive gathering. This year's event had great attendance, around 900 in total. And that included 50 heads of state or government, plus 100 ministers. Of course, they had a lot to discuss. Two wars are raging in Ukraine and Gaza. China's maritime expansionism continues. And North Korea keeps firing missiles. If that wasn't enough, a bombshell dropped on the first day. A prominent Russian critic was announced dead. Alexei Navalny. His wife actually attended the summit. In her speech, she squarely blamed the Russian president. And so the fireworks began. Ukraine's Volodymyr Zelensky attended the summit. He used his speech to call for more aid. Dear friends, unfortunately, keeping Ukraine in the artificial deficit of weapons, particularly in deficit of artillery and long range capabilities, allows Putin to adapt to the current intensity of the war. The aid winter is already hurting. Today, Ukrainian soldiers retreated from a key city. It is Russia's biggest win since May last year. So the news from the front lines is not good. Many soldiers say they are running out of bullets. Another popular topic was Donald Trump. He recently accused European nations of not pulling their weight in NATO, of not spending enough on defense. It seems to have triggered a spark in EU leaders. Most of them call for more defense spending. And we should, because you also mentioned the West, the U.S., stop moaning and whining and nagging about Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not spend more on defense or we ramp up ammunition production because Trump might come back. Mm -hmm. So we have to do this because we want to do this, because it is in our interest. The European Union has to step up its defense uh, industrial base without any question. And therefore, we have to be much better in defense production. Irrelevant of the election results on this or the other side of the Atlantic, one thing is clear. We Europeans must take much more care of our own security, now and in the future. The readiness to do so is huge, and I said this to President Biden during my visit to Washington last week. 
you know, first of all, it's a very clear signal that Europe needs to do more. And uh, I'm happy to say, you know, that uh, that Lithuania this year we're reaching 2.77 uh, percent of our GDP towards uh, we're spending to defense. So that summits are important for two reasons. One, they give us insights. What is the United States thinking? What is Europe thinking? What is China up to? Basically, a lot of clarity. And two, it's a good chance for rivals to speak. Just meet and see where it goes. But this time, two Western rivals were not even invited, Russia and Iran. The organizers said they were not interested in dialogue. And this has created a lopsided narrative because most Western politicians had the same script. Bash Putin, hail Zelensky and Navalny, warn China and end the speech. That's how it went. Having said that, a few key conversations did take place. One of them involved India's foreign minister, Dr. S.J. Shankar. He was part of a panel on multilateralism. Alongside him were two other foreign ministers, Antony Blinken of the U.S. and Anna Baerbock of Germany. The first question to Minister Jaishankar was on India's relations with Russia. Is India picking and choosing its engagements? Listen to his response. Is that a problem? Why should it be a problem? If I'm smart enough to have multiple options, you should be admiring me. You know, you shouldn't be criticizing. <laughs> now, is, is that a problem for other people? I don't think so. I don't think so, certainly in this case uh, and in that case, because, look, uh, we try to explain what are the different pulls and pressures which countries have. I don't want you to even inadvertently uh, give the impression that we are purely and, you know, unsentimentally transactional. We are not. Uh, you know, we get along with people. We believe in things. We share things. We agree on some things. So it's not just transactional. India does believe in values and interests. The other topic was the Gaza war. Where does India stand on Israel's offensive? Jay Shankar explained in five points. Again, listen in. Number one, we must be clear that what happened on October 7th was terrorism. No caveats, no justification, no explanation. It was terrorism. Number two, uh, as Israel responds, it is important that Israel should be, should have been uh, very mindful of civilian casualties, uh, that uh, it has an obligation to observe international humanitarian law. Uh, number three, uh, the return of hostages is today imperative. Uh, number four, there is a need for a humanitarian corridor, a sustainable humanitarian corridor to provide relief. And eventually, there has to be a, a permanent fix, a long-term fix. Otherwise, we're going to see a recurrence. And I think today, uh, certainly India has long uh, believed in a two-state solution. We have uh, maintained that position for many decades. Jashankar also spoke on India's ties with the West. He said India is a non-West country, but not an anti-West country. Later, he also had a brief conversation with China's foreign minister, that's Wang Yi. He too was in Munich for the talks. The two men were seen speaking to each other. It was their first interaction in over six months. That's why such events are important. They give you a platform to talk, not with friends, but with rivals. Unfortunately, this Munich conference did not offer a lot of that. There was a lot of negative energy at play, almost a sense of hopelessness. The conference's annual report summed it up best. It said, the world's new direction was lose-lose. <laughs> Our next story is from the United States, and it features Donald Trump. We know him as many things. 45th U.S. president, Republican leader, reality TV star, businessman. But here's one thing we don't know him as. Sneakerhead. Donald Trump has launched his own sneaker line. This weekend in Philadelphia, he presented a pair at the Sneaker Con. And like true Trump fashion, it's gold in color. It costs $399, and it's called... The Never Surrender High Tops. Our next report tells you all about Trump's new business venture. That's the real deal. That's the real deal. And we appreciate it. We really appreciate it. More than anything else, I appreciate the turnout. 
because they say they've never had a turnout like this. The real deal. That's what Donald Trump calls it. He was in Philadelphia this weekend, attending SneakerCon, the biggest sneaker show on earth. That's where he launched this sneaker. It's a gold, shiny high top. There's the American flag on the back, and it costs three hundred and ninety-nine dollars. It's available for purchase on his new site. It's called GetTrumpSneakers.com. But it's not the only version. There are low-top ones. They are called T-Wave and Potus Forty Five. They are priced at one ninety-nine dollars. There's also a cologne and a bottle of perfume for sale as well. But if you want to get your hands on a pair, there's bad news for you. They are already sold out. Only a thousand pairs of the sneakers were available, and the website says they sold like hotcakes. So when did the former president become a sneakerhead? He was always a businessman. But what explains this new penchant for sneakers? If you ask Trump, he says he's been wanting to do it for years now. You, you know, I've wanted to do this for a long time. I have some incredible people that work with me on things, and they came up with this. And this is something I've been talking about for 12 years, 13 years, and I think it's going to be a big success. According to the website, the products are trademarks of CIC Ventures LLC. It says Trump sneakers are not designed, manufactured, distributed, or sold by Donald J. Trump. So the company uses his name, it uses his image, and his likeness, all in a license agreement. But does that make these true Trump sneakers? Well, depends on who you ask. Trump may be selling a three ninety nine dollar sneakers at SneakerCon, but he has a three fifty five million dollar fine to pay back. The verdict came from a New York court. It says Trump lied about the value of his properties. He was accused of overstating his net worth almost by as much as three point six billion dollars every year. This made bankers give him better loan terms. So now he has to pay back the state of New York. Plus, Trump and his company cannot apply for loans in the state for three years. Of course, Trump has slammed the ruling. He says he will appeal it. But until then, the question is, how will he pay the fine? According to estimates, Trump's net worth was around two billion dollars in 2021. This fine could cost 15 percent of his wealth. So he could either sell assets or appeal to his loyal supporters, maybe even sell sneakers for that matter. But this isn't his only legal problem. Trump faces four more state and federal criminal trials in New York. So no matter what he chooses to do, it could be a big blow to his presidential campaign. Our next story is from Africa, from its biggest economy, Nigeria. Nigerian President Bola Tinubu is under fire again, this time over allegations of nepotism. He recently announced a shakeup in Nigeria's Federal Housing Authority, and he's appointed this man. As the new MD slash CEO, Oyetunde Ojo, he's a former Nigerian MP. He served from 2011 to 2015, but he failed to get re-elected in the 2015 election. After that, he turned to business, reportedly in the oil and gas sector, and now he's the CEO of a, of a housing authority. What's his qualification? Apparently, over a decade's worth of experience in the housing and hospitality industries. That's what the Nigerian government said while appointing him. But exactly when did this happen? When did he get the time to acquire this decade's worth of housing experience? It remains a mystery, but the Nigerian government insists that he is the best man for the job. Of course, they need to hype up his credentials to deflect from his other big achievement. And what's that? Being married to Fola Shade Tinubu, the oldest daughter of President Bola Tinubu. Nepotism is never good for optics, after all, and the last thing Tinubu needs is another scandal. The Nigerian president has been racking up controversies ever since he took office. The last one was about an oil field, an offshore oil block called OPL two four five. It was a disputed field, bought by European oil giants Eni and Shell. There were corruption allegations. Nigeria had sued the oil companies. The case was pending in international tribunals, but last month. The president of Nigeria restored the fields to the Europeans. 
he ended all legal disputes over the offshore field and called for the matter to be resolved amicably. Now, you can choose to look at this as Tinubu moving forward, as him dropping a long dispute and getting back to business. Or you may wonder about the timing. Any one of the European oil firms involved here signed another deal recently. This happened a few months ago. They sold their Nigerian onshore assets to a local firm, a firm called Onado PLC. The sale was very beneficial for the Nigerian oil company. Its total oil reserves doubled after it bought any's assets. And guess who is the chief executive of the Onado group? A man called Adewale Tinubu, or Wale as he's popularly known. The last name is not a coincidence. He is related to the Nigerian president too. He is the president's nephew. So a European oil company sells its business to Tinubu's nephew. The nephew's company benefits and Nigeria drops litigation against the European soon after. What does that sound like to you? Allegations of nepotism and corruption are hounding the president. But that's not all. He's also been accused of using his office for personal gain, using it to fund a luxurious lifestyle, like with the yacht controversy. Tinubu became president last year. He took office in the month of May. His government had to release a supplementary budget to allocate resources for, for this year. And this happened in November. The budget came in November. But while the budget was being discussed, an anomaly came to light. Money was earmarked for a presidential yacht, a princely sum of 5 billion naira. That's about 3.5 million US dollars. Now, Nigeria is an economic powerhouse, but it's still a developing nation. There is massive wealth inequality. People are struggling with a cost of living crisis and reeling after the government reduced fuel subsidies last year. In this environment, President Bola Tinubu was buying a yacht on the taxpayer's dime. You can imagine the uproar. Nigerians were furious. So were opposition lawmakers. They forced the government to divert the yacht money. It was funneled into a student loan fund instead. But you see, the yacht had already been delivered by then to the Nigerian Navy. So now they have to find a way to pay for the luxury boat. And these are just some of the controversies that have dogged Tinubu since he took office. There are others as well. And by the looks of it, there will be more to come. Hopefully, Nigeria will continue to progress despite the extravagance of its president and the enrichment of his family. Now, let's talk about an impending global crisis, the cocoa market boom. Cocoa, as you may know, is the key ingredient in chocolate. It is mostly grown in two countries, Ivory Coast and Ghana, both in West Africa. But the crop there is failing, which is why global cocoa prices are rising. Cocoa production in West Africa has been hit by multiple disasters, disease and volatile weather being the major ones. Now, these are natural factors with no short term solutions. But another force is also causing cocoa prices to spike. An unnatural force, which is always ready to add fuel to any fire. Wall Street. Hedge funds are getting in on the cocoa price surge. What does that mean? Investment bankers may be making your chocolates unaffordable. Here's our report. Cocoa prices broke a record recently, a record set 46 years ago. In the United States, their prices surged higher than what they were in the 1970s. Cocoa was trading at more than double the level it was from just a year ago, at over $6,000 a ton. The age of affordable chocolates might be ending. Soon, your favorite treat might become a luxury, and all the chocoholics out there might be in for crippling withdrawal symptoms. But how did it come to this? Why are cocoa prices skyrocketing? There are various reasons. Starting with a deadly virus called the cocoa swollen shoot virus disease. This pathogen infects cocoa trees using insects to spread from one to another. It causes leaves to go red then deforms them and it also causes cocoa shoots and roots to swell. Hence the name. The disease slowly reduces a cocoa tree's crop yield and finally kills the plant. This disease has been ravaging West Africa for years, especially Ghana which is the world's second largest cocoa producer after its neighbor Ivory Coast. Together, the countries produce about 60% of the world's cocoa and swollen shoot virus is decimating trees in both countries. This means lower cocoa production.
Lower supplies lead to higher prices and so you have sky-high prices in global commodity exchanges. Volatile weather exacerbated by climate change has also reduced crop output, leading to a poor harvest last season. Cocoa prices had been rising for a while, but the poor harvest caused a surge. It also led to something else. Cocoa prices caught the eye of Wall Street bankers. Hedge funds that traditionally stay away were lured by potential profits in cocoa. They began investing in the commodity, buying up contracts and fueling the surge in prices. Hedge fund activity helped pump up cocoa prices in hopes of a good payout. And they've started cashing out now, making a tidy profit in the process. But while Wall Street is reaping the rewards, what does it mean for the rest of us? Well, chocolate will get more expensive. You may have noticed it already when you tried to buy chocolates for Valentine's Day. If you did not, you'll probably feel the pinch by the end of the year because it is the price of cocoa futures that spiked. Futures, as the name suggests, that's the future price that will get cashed in by the cocoa harvest later this year. You can expect chocolates to be expensive this Christmas. So while Wall Street struck brown gold, consumers will have to foot the bill eventually. But what about cocoa farmers struggling in Ghana and the Ivory Coast? Will the price surge mean they benefit? Well, yes and no. Both Ghana and the Ivory Coast pay fixed rates to cocoa farmers. The price is set for the whole year. This is so the farmers are protected from market volatility. So this means they won't immediately benefit from the high prices, but they could make more money next season if their governments increase their cut. For now, the lives of the farmers won't change much. It's only the Wall Street tycoons laughing all the way to the bank. By now, you probably know what Riz means. It's a Gen Z internet slang and it seems to be everywhere. Riz refers to style or charm. But do you know what a Rizzler is? The word is der derived from Riz, but it has an entirely different meaning. Rizzler refers to a good person. If you're confused, let me tell you, this is only the beginning. Welcome to the language of Generation Alpha or Gen Alpha, the cohort coming up right behind Gen Z. The only generation born fully in the 21st century. Gen Alpha is born between 2010 and 2024. So the oldest children are on the cusp of turning 14. The youngest will be born this year. These are the children of millennials. Basically, they can maneuver iPads, but they can't tie their own shoelaces. And they have begun a generational rite of passage by using their own slang words, birthing new trends and befuddling their elders in the process. One thing sets them apart. Gen Alpha is a landmark generation. You see, the global population has been changing for a while now. It is getting richer, becoming better educated and more exposed to digital technology. But Gen Alpha kids will surpass all those who came before them. They will grow up to be the best educated generation ever, the most tech supplied generation ever and the wealthiest generation ever. They're also expected to be the largest in history at more than 2 billion people. So about time we get to know them better. There's a much needed primer on Gen Alpha. Let's start with technology. Think of this generation like an unintentional global experiment. They began being born in 2010 when app was the word of the year, 2010, the same year when Instagram was created and the iPad was introduced. That's why these children are called iPad kids. Screens were placed in front of them to, from the get-go as pacifiers, as educational aids, or as entertainers. They're the first entirely online cohort, and they've always had a media-centric childhood. They're comfortable with it. They're adapting to artificial intelligence much quicker and much better as well. Gen Alpha grew up with Siri and Alexa in their homes. They have chat GPT in schools. The AI model is being used as a learning tool. So the blurring lines between AI and human don't freak out Gen Alpha. And this can help them as they join the workforce. After all, AI at work is inevitable and the landscape of work is changing as well. For the previous generations, medicine or engineering were seen as the ideal career options. But not for the young anymore. 
They're exploring more avenues, like influencing on social media. Gen Z may have championed it, but Gen Alpha is picking up the tricks of the trade much sooner. Kids are turning into online influencers and boosting their own trends. They're also driving services, specifically catering to children, from skin care to payment apps. Generation Alpha is also known to spend money more easily, making them the perfect target audience, which explains why marketers are busy wrapping their heads around this generation. Preteens, kids, toddlers, babies, the unborn, you name it. But things aren't all hunky-dory among Gen Alpha. The most defining event of their lives was the Wuhan virus pandemic that affected how kids study and how, how well they score. Research shows that test scores have seen a drop since the pandemic and student absenteeism has soared. Their social connections took a hit as well, taking a toll on their mental health. And on top of that, they're suffering from climate anxiety at a young age. Generation Alpha is being born during the hottest years on record. Climate change is raging the world over and the youngest generations are battling it more than their elders had to. Now, like every generation that came before them, Gen Alpha has their own set of perks too, just as they have unique baggage. They can only hope that inscrutable memes serve as a good coping mechanism while Gen Z slow, slowly join millennials in feeling what boomers felt for decades, being annoyed at computers. After talking about Gen Alpha, which may as well seem like an alien species to many, let's talk about actual outer space, more specifically asteroids. They're small, rocky objects that orbit the sun, and now they're making headlines on Earth. In a first, scientists have found water on asteroids. Now, this is an exciting finding. It has negated previous assumptions about asteroids. It could boost studies for futuristic space missions and even tell us how water ended up on Earth. Our next report tells you more. Our solar system was formed about 4.6 billion years ago when a big cloud of gas and dust collapsed. Most of the dust fell to the center of the cloud. This formed the sun. Other condensing dust particles became planets. But some objects never had the chance to turn into planets. They were left over. And today, they are called asteroids. Asteroids are small rocky objects. No two asteroids are alike. But they all orbit the sun, much like planets. Now, asteroids are much smaller than planets, but sometimes they can become big news on planet Earth. Asteroids have been grabbing a lot of headlines lately. Last year, an asteroid sample arrived on Earth. NASA studied it and found traces of carbon. Last month, an asteroid exploded over Berlin. Earlier this month, the Japanese space agency studied asteroid rocks and found evidence of seeds of life. Basically, compounds that can tell the story of Earth's origins. Now, asteroids are in the news again. In a cosmic first, scientists have discovered water on the surface of asteroids. The discovery has been made by the Texas-based Southwest Research Institute. The scientists studied four asteroids, which were rich in silicate, a material that includes silicon and oxygen. On two of these asteroids, scientists found water molecules. Both the asteroids developed close to the sun, so they could be storing water in different ways. Water could be trapped in silicate beads, or it could be bound to minerals on the asteroids. The how is still a matter of scientific study, but the what is clear. There is water on asteroids. And this is big news, but it's not entirely shocking. Scientists have discovered water on asteroids previously, but only in samples brought to Earth. This is the first time water molecules have been identified on asteroids floating in space. This charts new territory in astronomy. It was previously believed that water evaporates from asteroids close to the sun, due to the heat. This new finding challenges that notion as water molecules were found on asteroids closely orbiting the sun. It shows that liquid water can exist for eons on space rocks in the inner solar system. This discovery also boosts further study. It tells us more about the composition of asteroids. It shows how water is distributed across the solar system. It can hint at how water ended up on Earth. Water is life-sustaining, so this recent finding can prove crucial for space missions in the future. But finding water on asteroids is just the first step. 
The next goal is to understand the distribution of water on asteroids. It is to learn how water has remained trapped on asteroids. Once that is cracked, scientists can finally learn more about how water ended up on Earth. And not to water down the argument, but that would be a game changer. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In France, carnival season kicks off on the French Riviera with parades and floats. In China, stand sandstorms turn skies orange in the country's northwest. And in London, cats are reclaiming the catwalk by strutting down the runway. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1945, U.S. Marines invaded Iwo Jima. This was during the Second World War. The island was under Japanese control, but the U.S. considered it to be strategically important. The battle for this island lasted for five weeks. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.